Hello, hello, and welcome to Art Pop Talk. I'm Bianca. And I'm Gianna. Bianca, are we the drama? I don't think we're the drama. Maybe we are. <laughs> Today, we're talking about a little bit of drama we stirred up on TikTok. I didn't think of all the things people were going to get all up in a tizzy about this one. But alas, Gianna, anything is possible on the internet. So <laughs> we are using today's Art Pop Talk to work through a clearly very heated topic, the STEM versus STEAM debate. What is STEM and should it really include that A for literally all of the arts? And to help us talk it all out, we've got an expert in curriculum joining us today. We are so excited for you all to meet the one and the only, the OG, Adrian Turner, a photographer and educator, and the third Fink sister. Well, we have a lot to get into today, so let's get started. Hey, hey. <laughs> I hope you all know when Bianca and I record and we take a little pause to allow ourselves to insert our intro music. We always just do a little, like, little bop in our chairs, and it makes me really happy. <laughs> yeah, we just add a, a few little dance moves in there, even though you can't always see it. We're, we're grooving to the APT theme music over here. No, it's literally just like a physical reminder to be like, add music, head bop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> pause for effect. <laughs> dance to APT music. So how you doing, Gianna? How's the new apartment treating you? It's good. I'm hoping I'm hoping today my audio is not going to be too echoey. I am in right now an empty room, which is soon to be uh, Theban and I's workspace area. Um, but the apartment's hanging. Everything's looking cute. I have some purchases in the works for the apartment that I am very excited about. I feel like getting a little crafty these days. So I bought some contact paper, you know, I've bought some like organizational shelving type things. And today I'm going to go pick up a old secretary's desk. Cute. But I don't know, maybe I'm just way too excited about this idea, but I feel like it's really fucking clever and I don't have any friends so I need to tell everybody about it here because like I don't I literally have no one else to talk to about it so Theban and I are in this apartment so I'm trying to have things be functional as well as fun so one of the things is that our kitchen cabinetry shelving situation is like less than ideal so for all the wine glasses and stemware and all that jazz, it's really, there's like just no space for it right now. Um, and Theban really likes to play games and we have also like millions of books. So between like the stemware, the alcohol, the books, <laughs> the games, books. <laughs> like we have so, we have, we have so many books. Like we already have them all all of our books in our entertainment center, but then mm -hmm. I brought all of mine. And so we're also going to have to get like a bookcase. Like we have, we have a lot of books where we're a book kind of fam over here. But uh -huh. um, so what I'm going to do with the secretary's desk, it's really cute because you know how some of them have like the pull down top. Um, so you can pull it down or it's more like a hutch kind of look and the desk uh -huh. art folds just up and down. Oh, cool. kind of like a bar would. So oh, cool. I found a secretary's desk that actually didn't have a lot of the internal little shelving for like stationery and stuff. Cause I was mm -hmm. just going to cut all that out, but I found one that was already completely empty. And then it just has drawers on the bottom. So uh -huh. I'm going to turn this little secretary's desk into a bar. Oh, cute. Yeah. I'm like, I think I'm really fucking clever to be honest. Like oh, I feel I like. I love it. And then I can put all of our like books, like extra books and like games, um, just uh -huh. like in this little like hutch thing. And the top of it, this one I found too, the top of it is also um, flat. Like a lot of them are 
they lay flush up against the wall. So like the top is at a perfect like triangle point. But uh-huh. this one, the top is flat so I can still put stuff on top of it like keys and shit, you know? Oh, cool. Yeah, Look I feel you. like I feel very clever about it, but I'm also a loser and I don't have anybody else to tell about it. So that You're is my not story. A loser. That is so cool. About and the Gianna, secretary's desk. You know what? I feel like ergonomics is a very cool thing that like I'm interested in in terms of you know, the science of it all and how that, that could impact design. Do do arts and science go go together, Bianca? Well, Gianna, it's funny that you said, you know, like form, and, form function. and function and, you know, trying to be functional, but also like trying to be cute. I feel I mean, like what a concept. <laughs> I mean, I, I that's why our world separates the categories because they obviously don't go together. Like I'm just talking bollocks over here. Two right. very different things. Two very different things. <laughs> well, in lieu of art news, you know, I think I think we're the art news. I think that I want to come up with a different segment instead of when we don't have art news. I think it needs to be like, <laughs> like APT drama corner or something. <laughs> I think as we should go ahead and get into, it works very well for today's topic. <laughs> So, Gianna, are we ready to art pop talk? Well, as you've said, Gianna, the tea is tart today. (laughs) And, And let me tell you, let me tell you why. So I posted a TikTok a week or two ago now, and the audio is from this, like, podcaster guy that really I actually have, like, no idea who he is. I'll, I'll have to look into it. But all of the like socialist people on our TikTok were like, oh, I love that guy or, or whatever. But the audio was... Is that what they teach you in college nowadays? I thought all they taught you was homosexual Marxism. Okay, so that was the audio. And then the caption on the TikTok was POV, you tell someone in quote unquote STEM that people in the arts work just as hard and deserve to be paid. And wowie, was that a a concept people were not a fan of, which to my surprise, I don't know. They they really had strong opinions about this. And, you know, we, we have strong opinions too, but this was really the first time that I've seen this kind of, not, I, I guess some of it got, hostile in a way, but this type of really argumentative and like a really strong conviction. This was really the first TikTok we posted where I've seen that type of dialogue in our comments. So on our TikTok, you know, Gianna and I talk a lot about kind of things that we experience working in the arts as people who are trying to start out our career, as we've talked a lot about on the show as well. There are so many things that we love about art and art history and all of the arts in general, but we obviously have frustrations with it. And, and we've talked to you guys about that quite a bit. We can, we could go on and on about, you know, problems of the art world, particularly in this instance here, I was talking about pay and you guys know um, you can definitely, and if you haven't yet, I would obviously encourage our conversation with Onyx Montez on salary transparency, but there seems to be a very large disconnect here with how people in the in the arts are, are actually working and, and making a living. So you guys know that Gianna and I have, both have degrees. I have a master's degree. Many people go on to get their PhD in all different kinds of of arts and it is something that is deserving of a living wage. And I'm not saying that automatically just because you have your PhD, you should be getting, you know, hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars. That is in no way what I'm saying. But so much of the time, the arts and people who work in creative spaces are undervalued and not paid what they deserve. You know, we've talked about this in my case it's tough. I'm struggling to pay off my student loans. And I was under the impression that getting a master's degree would 
get me in the door of a career that I could really build. And, <laughs> and that was, that was Yana's cackling. I'm so sorry. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It was, it's, but that's, that's exactly it's, what it's I'm rough. talking about here is like, <laughs> I'm, I'm not saying that, that I, I, I automatically deserve like, you know, a hundred thousand dollars or whatever in, in my first job. That is in no way what I'm saying, even though some engineers get that right of that, but that's not, that's not the point here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I'm saying that any person, any human being working in a position deserves to get a living wage. And people in the comments did not like that. Did not and agree. And it was really interesting to see this kind of like visceral reaction. And it was against my artwork. I don't, I don't make artwork. And people were coming off like, well, your art must not be very good. And I was like, not an artist, but I was like, wait, what? I was like, I was like, (laughs) you're like, you're, you're right. My, my art is not good. My non-existent art. (laughs) Yeah. Like. What are you talking about here? Nothing about this, nothing about my my caption in the TikTok suggested that I was an artist at all. My caption to the whole video was, let's use STEAM because art uh, art is also a part of our everyday lives and isn't something to be ignored. So that, that's a whole, a, se- a separate issue that we'll get into, obviously. But people were coming after me like, if your art isn't good, it doesn't have value. And that's why people won't buy it. And that's why you won't make a living. I was like, how do I, how do I even begin to explain to these people that the arts are so much more than painting? And you and I joke a lot about that. We've talked about that in our Bumble episode, in our, in our Mm -hmm. dating episode, because there's this automatic association that like paint is, is art. And that's, that's all it is. And that's clearly the the perspective that people were coming from. This one person even was so strong to tell me that my TikTok video was clearly about that. He was like, well, if this isn't what you were saying, then you weren't making a very good video. I was like, what if, what is TikTok if not for broad generalizations about things, which in itself, what is STEAM and STEM if not clearly a broad generalization because we are missing the point here, folks. Like we are not <laughs> on the same level. And so often, and we'll talk about that assumption, the assumption when you say the word art in anything is that you were talking about someone who is a, a visual artist, right? Mm-hmm. We are not getting the assumption that arts is a category in which countless workers and jobs circulate that market and that industry. Like we could wrap in our performing artists, we could write, wrap in our audible artists, our spoken word, our, our written authors. Like there is so much to being a creative person. So the right. assumption of it all is really what got like got me going as I was watching it all (laughs) unfold. Oh my gosh, truly. And even on top of that, as we'll get into, I mean, we're not just talking about people who create, right? Graphic designers, artists, dancers. We're not talking about the people who who make things Mm -mm. and do things. We are talking about interior decorators, interior designers. We're talking about engineers who work at art museums. We're talking about technicians who work at art museums. We're talking about, as we'll get into with Adrian, education and teaching. We're, we're talking about our entire, our entire world that is, is based in, in experience. And it's just, we're, we're talking about journalism. We're talking about television and film and, mm-hmm. Everything that you purchase, fashion, we're talking. And and you know what this reminded me of exactly to a T was Miranda Priestly telling Andy Sachs that her sweater, you know, just came from a pile of stuff. And she's talking about, it's not just blue, it's cerulean. And, and you know, you think that this 
these belt buckles are, are the same, but yeah. And that you're not. better and you're not a part of these like things that like you're critiquing and that things that you think don't matter. Right. Just because you think that the arts is just a pile of stuff and you know, it's actually not, it's not it necessary. Is, it's filled yeah. with every single decision that you make across your lifetime what color car do you buy? The design of, of an automobile that you might like, the lighting in a restaurant, food, anything that we consume in our bodies, packaging, a, a wine label. How many of you just go into a store and, and buy a beer because the label is cool? I mean, it's just everything about our lives is so experiential. And uh, and so many of the comments were honing in on this one idea that I am not personally making a living because my artwork is bad and, and my art is not valuable and clearly I'm not good at it and I shouldn't be doing it and I should be focusing on something else because nobody will want to put value towards something that they don't like. When in reality, that is exactly what all of these people are doing on an everyday basis. Well- yeah, and then it I just felt like because collectively people so miss the mark that even the people who were more agreeable to the steam conversation were more caught up in still the 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 comments that were completely missing the mark. We were still wrapped up in the visual art of it all. Right. So th- so there were two kind of issues happening here. And that's, that's a great point, Gianna. So let's get into the second one. The first one is like art is only one thing. And how can we add value to that? Because you suck, whatever. (laughs) And then the second part of that was going into my caption for the video about using steam instead of STEM, because clearly we're having a problem where the arts are only viewed as one thing, right? And a lot of people were actually very interesting and brought up really interesting points that they they appreciate the arts and and we should not be undervalued no like the arts are obviously like clearly so important to our everyday lives but they are not necessarily sure that they belong in the word steam or or need to be associated with the word or term stem which i thought was interesting and and i do see that point because stem as we'll get into science, technology, engineering, and math. Where do the arts fit into that? Clearly, a lot of us understand that they are part of that. They, they, they flow back and forth. Science is a part of art and art is a part of the sciences, right? But why do we get this breakdown of STEM and why is there this importance and focus on STEM? But adding that addition of the arts is gets tricky. And as we'll get into with Adrian why is it that there's an A for all of the arts, but STEM and and the sciences get this kind of breakdown? So to a lot of people's like really appreciative credit, I I definitely see that point about like, well, maybe we need another term or like, they're just not sure that that STEAM is appropriate or applicable in a lot of situations because this term applies to just the sciences. But here we are over in the arts trying to assert ourselves into those fields and let people know that we we are a part of of everyday everyday life just as much as the sciences are. And I also want to let people know that <laughs> Gianna and I believe in science. Like we we love science. We appreciate and value all of the categories under STEAM. At 1000% and we also it was so funny because the people in the comments who were on the kind of steam side, but were being very like positive and engaging. And we're just saying that they love art and, and they're part, they are part of both worlds very much. They were women <laughs> commenting and being like, on behalf of the STEM community, I am so sorry for what's happening right now. <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> we love women in STEM. You know what I mean? Like we in no way are trying to delineate the amazing power of science and right now I think especially that's like I just want to note that that like we're not trying to you know we're not trying to take away anyone else's you know importance over here we're just trying to show you another side to that right or how or how we can be involved and we shouldn't be undervalued because you don't think we're important 
I pinned a, a line of comments and we all know this, Gianna and I have talked about it before. Gianna and I like don't participate in internet culture very much. We're on it for art pop talk, but we do not involve ourselves in comment sections. Like we just don't believe in being hateful on the internet. And it's hard, uh, you know, you all know this, but it's hard to engage in a productive conversation when you have a limit of, you know, 140 characters or something like that in a, in a comment. Like you just, you just can't have a productive conversation. But in lieu of that, I kind of pinned to the top of our comment section so you guys can go look at it. This, this is what I posted a thread of comments to try to just explain myself a little bit more. So I feel like the largest misconception happening in the comments right now is that I am strictly referencing a practicing artist, which I am not. I don't make or sell any art. I'm talking about liberal arts, humanities, and creatives at large. And I see many of the points about STEM versus STEAM. Why do all of the sciences get a quote unquote STEM and all of the arts just get that one letter A? There in itself has been leading to the problem here that art is just one thing. I also want to say, let's please stop playing the game of what work is harder. I reference this in the video to only mean that we all work hard. Many of us do not and will not have the experience of the other side. So how will any of us know or have the right to even qualify what work is harder? We're all working hard at what we do. We all studied and we all trained for it. We all matter to our society and we deserve living wages for that work. Please be kind to one another. Nothing productive ever happened in a hateful comment section. Our pop talk is about kindness and discussion. So part of that comment thread was also, there was this issue of like, well, I'm a neurosurgeon and I work way harder than an artist and I deserve more pay. And that's just not, we, we Stop can't- Stop pinning one against the other. That's not what right. this conversation it's just, is about. Right. It's completely unproductive. And I will never know- the experience of being a neurosurgeon. I'm sure you work very hard, but that doesn't negate the fact that creatives also work hard. <laughs> and just because you think you work harder doesn't mean that we don't deserve a living wage. But, you know, that's the point of a conversation. So all of these really big questions, clearly something worth talking about. And in order to do that, you know, Gianna and I, thought we'd bring on a perfect person for the job. So we are going to bring on that STEAM and STEM expert. She is an actual educator who works in curriculum. Adrian has a bachelor's degree in elementary education and a master's degree in reading education. She has been a fourth grade teacher, a reading specialist, and is currently a curriculum and instruction specialist for pre-K through 12th grade in a public school district. She is also a professional photographer when she's not working in schools. All right, we are going to take a little break, and when we come back, we'll be joined by Adrian Turner. everybody. Adrian, we are so excited to finally have you here on the show. We've had your lovely husband on to talk with us about all things music. And, you know, sometimes we've even heard Jameson uh, screaming in the background, which has been fabulous. But now you are finally here. So can you introduce yourself to the Art Pop Tarts as the Cinderella Danielle de Barbarac? of this trio that we have here. <laughs> Tell them a little bit about who you are, what you do, and what makes you the perfect person to talk about STEAM and STEM with us. Hey guys, oh, I am so excited to be here today. Um, I love listening to you guys. I feel kind of special getting to be here with and talking with you. Today oh my God, but you awesome. like have to say that because you're a sister, <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much. But I love it. And people are like, what are you listening to? And I'm like, Art Pop Talk. And I try to recommend you guys with like a little disclaimer. So, 
They want to hear about some leftist art situation. <laughs> that is what I say. <laughs> because I live in Oklahoma, I have to just, I leave a little disclaimer, but most people are like, yeah, that sounds great. Do you want some oh, truly biased art information? <laughs> Here you go. Um, okay, so I, I'm Adrian. I um, t- currently, I am a curriculum and instruction specialist for at a school district in Oklahoma. So basically what that means is I help all of our teachers, pre-K through 12, um, with anything that has to do with what they teach or how they teach it. So like in bigger districts, they have someone um, for like grade levels and content. So they'll have like an elementary person just for language arts, a secondary person just for language arts. Um, but me and one other person do pre-K through 12, all subjects. And so I feel like I'm the perfect person to talk to today because I get to see how, because I work with all subjects, I get to see how they overlap and Mm -hmm. affect each other. And then also vertically pre-K through 12. Um, I, you know, I get to see the big picture, which is awesome. Mm Mm-hmm. We started a STEM program in our elementary schools a few years ago, and we've been working since then to vertically align the curriculum so that students have a clear path from kindergarten through 12th for any STEM-related fields that they want to explore post-high school. Wonderful. Uh, Adrian. we are so freaking happy to have you here, and I feel as though I just need to say this a little disclaimer before we get into things. Adrian was one of our educators. I feel like predominantly one of my educators. She's been a huge mentor (laughs) in my life. So you are, um, yeah, you're definitely like it is all I'm going to say. So we are excited. I'm going to start crying. (laughs) Adrian, this is why you are the Cinderella de (laughs) Babarak and I'm just a piece of trash Jacqueline. (laughs) Shiana, I love you and you're beautiful. (laughs) Oh my God, I'm going to cry. Don't, don't. I actually think this is interesting, Gianna, that you bring that up because Adrienne was my basically like dance and color guard and performing arts instructor, but she was also like for you no, a tutor no. in many ways. And that's no, just like really she interesting that. No, she has no idea. Like, yeah. Yeah. Like, <laughs> Bianca, I helped you with your math too. Yeah. I had actually a lot of people help me with my math. Yeah. <laughs> My Gianna, we were like, you know, working on reading. It was awesome. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's get into it. Don't cry. It's going to be okay. okay um, <laughs> so can you talk with us about any origins of STEM and particularly how and when this concept of grouping these sciences started to impact curriculum and our educational system? Yeah. So I'm just, just so we have a common language, STEM is an acronym for science, technology, engineering, engineering, and math. And STEAM is an acronym and it just adds art in there, science, technology, engineering, art, and math. So we're going to go all the way back to the launch of the Russian space satellite Sputnik in 1957. I just watched that episode of Friends. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) But Nick, <laughs> um, yes. So after that, after Russia launched that space satellite, there was a huge emphasis placed on math and science in American schools so that we could be better global competitors. So then after that, we have the creation of NASA and big pushes from President Kennedy for more innovation. And we also put a man on the moon. Then in the 1970s and 80s, we saw national science programs being established, and we also saw the first cell phone, the first space shuttle launch, and the first personal computer. So starting in 1957, all the way through the 80s, you just got a lot of science and technology career fields, a lot of Mm -hmm. um, inventions, a lot is going on. Mm -hmm. Then in the 90s, we see the National Science Education Standards and the National Council of Teachers in Mathematics, and they gave teachers standards and guidelines to help shape curriculum in K-12 through and better prepare students in STEM. So we've got all these jobs out in the career field, and then in the 90s, they start helping teachers in the classroom, give them more guidelines. Um, this was also one of the first times that the acronym was used to define the topic of STEM, and the National Science Foundation originally called it SMET, <laughs> but then they changed it <laughs> to STEM in 2001, which I didn't know that. I was researching. I was like, they missed an opportunity there. <laughs> I was like, I feel like we should have kept it SMET. <laughs> oh, my 
my gosh. Um, That's funny. Yeah, so in 2001, we've got STEM. Also in the early 2000s, several published reports showed that American students' performance in STEM was trailing behind other countries. So in 2009, President Obama announced the Educate to Innovate initiative, and the goal of that initiative was to move U.S. students to the top of the pack in science and math achievement over the next 10 years. Um, But STEM education is more than taking individual science, technology, engineering, and math courses. It's not just like checking those boxes. Okay, I took a science class, I took a math class. It's more the STEM education movement advocates for moving away from those segmented content areas. And it goes to emphasizing technology to connect all of the subjects and relating teaching to the outside world. STEM impresses 21st century skills acquisitions so that students gain proficiency in collaboration, questioning, problem solving, and critical thinking. Taking more math and science classes in isolation isn't necessarily helpful for gains in innovation. They need all of those things to work together. So then recently, and I say that like it's in the past 15 years, which is recent for me because I'm old. (laughs) Um, But I can remember this happening when I was like in my college classes. There's been a movement to put the A in STEM, so to get the arts in there. This feels like a no-brainer to me. Like, why wouldn't we have that as a part of STEM? But um, I found this really good quote from Dr. Kristen Cook, and she's a longtime science educator. And she says, incorporating the A in STEAM, art, brings in personal expression, empathy, meaning making, and the purpose of what you're learning. It's the humanizing piece of transdisciplinary and interdisciplinary instruction, which I think makes so much sense. You know, you have, you have like what people, you know, you've got your STEM, like what people in their main have as science, technology, math, and engineering. And then you add this arts component and you just get the humanizing piece, the part that makes it connect to other people. So the STEAM movement is not an attempt to take away from STEM or its subject areas. Like adding the arts is not, is not taking away from anything else that STEM has been doing. But instead, the idea is to enhance the framework by invoking a greater sense of creativity. And I honestly can't see how you can have one without the other. So that was like just a brain dump of the history of STEM and that STEAM. Is- I love wildly that. fascinating. Yeah, that's so interesting. And thinking about in particular this idea, I mean, clearly, you know, we're based in the United States, but thinking about STEM and that very American centric identity that is part of that is wildly fascinating. And actually, Gian and I have talked about it on the podcast before, I think, but there's this clip of President Obama, and, and he didn't mean to, but, you know, I suppose with this. St- STEM movement, it it came naturally. And he kind of takes a dig at art history, saying that, you know, someone who gets maybe a technical two-year degree would be making more than a person in art history. And then he's like, no, 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 I don't mean that art history is bad, but like he, herein, herein lies the issue that we're talking about today. So it's funny that you bring up this <laughs> idea and this kind of like policy movement when I always kind of have that, that clip you know, playing in the back in the back of my mind. But as a follow-up, I want to hear from an educator what the benefits of STEM are. And this might seem like a silly question since I think that all of us here are in favor of, you know, believing in science and see the importance of a well-rounded education. But for example, like engineering, do we really cover engineering in education before college? Gianna and I went to like a very heavy engineering school. So I think that's part, you know, part of our issue as well is that we on our side as well are seeing this kind of dis- disconnect. And how are these kind of broad sections of the sciences used and viewed in your field? So i.e. like, are they viewed as essential? And then where does that come into play with the arts and other things that might not be viewed as quote unquote essential? Yeah. So short answer, yes, we do talk about the foundations of engineering as early as kindergarten. So one Mm. of our, in our STEM class, um, one of the standards for kindergarten is how does a building's design support its purpose? 
So they have, like we're talking about, they might do, like if we're talking about a greenhouse, how does the design of that greenhouse support the pur- the purpose of it as opposed to like the design of like a house that you live in? And mm-hmm. so while we're not getting into like the specifics of how the structure is built, is it going to be safe? Like, is it going to keep standing in a tornado? All of those things. But I start with those foundation principles of how does my design support its purpose? So yeah, it starts mm-hmm. really young and we lay those foundations really early. So if the definition of engineering is the branch of science and technology concerned with the design, building, and use of engines, machines, and structures, then I have to have a foundation for that. I need to start somewhere. What is the purpose of the building I want to make? How can I design it to support that purpose? You know, you have to start somewhere, and then I'm going to move on to the bigger concepts later. Now, your question about are they essential in elementary school especially, I think that's really going to depend on who you ask. Um, In Oklahoma and in many other states, we have a law that states if a student isn't proficient, isn't a proficient reader by the end of third grade, that they should be retained. That is, that's pretty common across the U.S. I don't know exactly how many states have that law, but we do have that one. And there are, you know, caveats, like we have some ways that we don't have to retain every student for that. But when teachers and building administrators have that pressure that says they have to read by the time that they, you know, leave third grade, they, they're going to focus on reading. Like they're not mm-hmm. going to put a lot of their emphasis on science and technology and math. Now I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. Like, yes, we need students to be able to read 100%. But I think that, you know, a really a really good teacher is going to bring in all of those science, technology, engineering into your math curric- or into your reading curriculum. So mm-hmm. I can read about science. I can read about those engineering concepts. I can read, you know, those math problems. So they kind of, they can kind of put it all together. So I think that they are essential, um, but there's a lot of pressure on teachers to just say, we're just going to teach reading. And I don't mm-hmm. blame them, to be honest. Mm-hmm. So it's very hard for an elementary teacher to find time in their day to just focus on science or social studies or technology, but really great teachers incorporate those texts into their reading lessons. And a big part of my team's job is to show how to incorporate technology in a meaningful way so that students are still learning how to read, but also how to be engineers, even in kindergarten. It's really challenging and I love it. (laughs) So we haven't even really touched on STEAM yet. Like that's Mm -hmm. all about STEM. So in our district, we have a dedicated STEM class, and then we also have an art class. And I really like that they're separate in the lower grades. Um, Students have a science class, they have a math class, and they are going to learn the concepts of science, like the foundational concepts of science, and then they'll learn the foundational concepts of math. And then STEM is where they can bring all of those concepts together with an engineering and technology and project-based learning. Um, They can learn the foundations, even like in their art class, and then they can pull that all together with critical thinking and problem solving in their STEM class. So when we're talking about their STEM class, it's really like looking at all of those things through a STEM lens, Mm -hmm. not necessarily teaching science, technology, engineering, Mm -hmm. math in isolation. Mm -hmm. Um, So does the A belong in STEM? Like, Absolutely it does because like I have to have that creativity in there. Like so when we're talking about when they're in their STEM class and then we're doing project-based learning and I want them to show me what they're learning, um, the art, the foundation pieces they've learned in their art class, they can bring that into their STEM class and they can, you know, better create a project or a more um, appealing project to the masses. Because part of what we talk about in our, um, when I train teachers is that students are going to be more likely to create something that has more value if they're creating it for a wider audience rather than just for their teacher. And so that art piece, if they can create something that's a little more visually appealing, then um, a wider audience is going to be more likely to be engaged in their project if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, art is woven into everything that we do. Um, so I think that it absolutely belongs in STEM. It should be STEAM. Like, I don't know why they're separated 
at all. Mm -hmm. (laughs) This is super interesting, even the way you're talking about, even though you're bringing in these concepts and, and weaving them together in different ways, it's still interesting that they are separated to bring in those foundations. And I, I definitely see the point in doing so. Obviously we need those foundations to like build upon them, like you were talking about, and then weave them together. But it's just, it's still interesting to me that the arts is that kind of separate thing that is then applied to other things instead of weaving them together at the ground level. So that's just something, I don't know, interesting that you're touching on. Not yeah. that it's a bad thing, and I, and I completely understand how, how it works in terms of, you know, I'm not an educator, how it works in terms of teaching little little ones, but it's just super interesting that even at the outset, there is this kind of other thing that is then applied to something else. For sure. And so what I think we need to remember about STEM and STEAM, and and, and I, I kind of, like, I almost don't even want to say STEM anymore. Like, I just want to, stay, want to say STEAM. That's all I mm-hmm. want to talk about it with. But what I think we need to remember is that someone, and, and I don't blame them for people who are not in education, but it's not just, I'm going to take a STEM class, or I'm sorry, I'm going to take a technology class a math class, an engineering class, um, and a science class. I'm not going to just check off those four boxes. As an educator, I am going to teach through the lens of those things, meaning I've got collaboration Mm -hmm. and and critical thinking. So when I add the arts in there, I think that when people look at that on the base level, it's like, well, why would you combine arts? all of the arts into one A. Like that is not doing it justice at all. Mm -hmm. But what it does is that it adds in creativity and innovation. So I'm, instead of thinking of the arts as all these separate pieces combined, Mm -hmm. what I, what we should be thinking of it as is I'm going to now teach through a lens of creativity and innovation. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's a really helpful way to look at it. Yeah. Yeah, Because all of the arts are different. They're important in their own ways. And I think that that is why it's important to have a separate class of like, okay, I have this art class in elementary. Mm -hmm. And as I grow in my, you know, later grades, I can go into photography and ceramics and printmaking and drawing. And I have all the different kinds of art classes. I'm going to learn the foundations of those. And then when I come to any other class, Mm because it doesn't just have to be a STEM class, we do have that in elementary, but any class that uses the teacher has a steam mindset, Mm -hmm. then she is teaching through that lens of creativity and innovation. Mm -hmm. And then students are just, it just, I feel like it just gives them the freedom to Mm -hmm. use the other side of their brain, right? Like they're not like locked into this, um, not that all science and math and technology people are just like, you know, the, the type A, like black and mm-hmm. white people, but sometimes. And so when I teach that STEAM lens, I feel like it just gives permission for students to have fun and incorporate mm-hmm. creativity and innovation. I don't know how many times I'm going to say that. Well, <laughs> right. And, and as it, you said it earlier. It works both ways too. Sorry, yeah. Gianna. It works both ways in that, Gianna, you could probably speak to this more than I could as an, as an actual practicing artist, but bringing in like math is so important to I, like printmaking or just putting something and and gritting something I mean Gianna you can talk more and you make sculptures so having that engineering background as well like building structures that's what you do well and I just to go back to almost uh your original definition when we first started getting into it I like the mindset that arts and culture bring to the table because it makes other subjects more applicable to lived experiences and just realities. I see so many jokes on the internet. Like I just saw one today that was ah, a lovely day of not needing to know algebra. <laughs> it's just some guy at the beach, you know? Um, and I think it gives that tangible Um, future experience and humanizes the learning condition of, of why all these things are such a melting pot of just how our world works. So I really like that you kind of brought that into the, using that common language of steam as a definition and like why it's just a melting pot of ideas. 
Yeah. Well, and even when we're talking about those upper level math courses, people ask this all the time, like, why do I need to know trigonometry and algebra two? And I think the answer to that is most people don't need to know that. But the skill of problem solving that you learn in that class and like depending on how your teacher teaches it, like using different strategies, I think the goal of that teacher is to get you to apply that to other things. Mm -hmm. Same thing with STEAM. I still think about with math and that's my biggest thing with sculpture and framing and print is fractions and using a ruler. Like it is my (laughs) biggest like that is my biggest math concept that I, I, I have to know. And every time I'm framing or matting something, I'm like, here we go. <laughs> yeah. Get yeah. my ruler out, use my fractions. Yes, exactly. Well, I'm looking, so I have this sentence in my notes and I just, I really like it. So I said, you know, to be successful and innovative in like a career that you choose, you can't leave the art out. Because if you do, it's just going to be functional. Whatever you are creating would be functional and it would stop at that. It wouldn't be innovative. So if I'm thinking about like designing a building or like, you know, I'm I am using this example of your art, Gianna, but that is going to be innovative no matter what because of what you're doing. <laughs> but like if I'm designing a building and I leave all of the artistic and creativity out of it, like it's going to be a box and it would be mm-hmm. functional and I could be in it and I could have a door, right? But or in windows, but the art and the creativity is what makes it innovative. And so And well, that example, Adrian, I I thought was so good too because when you talk about architecture and design, people have a more concrete understanding of the entire job and working force that like comes into infrastructure design, the laborer and the engineer and the architect of it all, and how we don't have that understanding of the the art world and how those different jobs circulate. And for example, you know, our dad was in construction. He was very much that type of labor, that worker, a craftsman. But Bianca has a good friend who is an architect. And so much of what perhaps she does, and maybe Bianca, obviously you could speak better to this, but even friends that I've had in architecture, they have to have a basic understanding of how you know, basic infrastructure and how things are made, but they're focused on the design of it. And an engineer is going to come in and they're going to tell you how to build it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just have to bring up Adolf Luce for all of my like art history theory people, (laughs) because Adrian, what you're talking about, the, the bare essence of something coming down to functionality is something that we actually talk about with art historical theory and this man, Adolf Luce, who stripped art and uh, design and decoration down to its its bare minimum. So, so basically he didn't believe in decoration, but at that base level, because of, of functionality and materiality, we talk about this bank in Vienna and Adolf Luce only wanted this, this to be or use this as an example of of structure. But we talk about it in art history because it is actually a beautiful building and it's the materiality, it's the structure of the marble that actually gives the bank this like phenomenal exterior. So you stripping something down to its bare bones, you're, if you're only coming at it from a functional perspective, in art history, we still talk about these things, these functional bare bones items or objects as works of art because they inevitably have something to them that is creative. What you're telling me is that we can't take the A out of STEAM. And you can't take (laughs) the STEAM or STEM out of the arts. Yeah. It works both ways. They have to be together. Right. Right. Yes. Always. (laughs) They all are always working together. Oh my goodness. Um, wow, we knew this was going to be a great episode and it's only going to get better. So I talked to Adrian about this next question a little bit the other day before we kind of got into the thick of it. Um, So this conversation got me going down a little bit of a rabbit hole, thinking about my own experiences in a public school in early education and taking this concept of 
stem and steam that establishes itself so early on as we've already been talking about. So not only do we need to make STEM more accessible and have that more clearly integrated within the arts, we're talking about this whole aspect of separating the two as well. And this is where we see that consequence and that pattern of arts and culture only being offered to students at an early age who, one, go to a school that provides this kind of extra art programming, or two, are placed by their school into these extra curricular classes. And that's just the terminology that I'm using, Adrian. If there's better language that we need to be using, I'm sure that you'll share that with us. But I'd like to hear Adrian's knowledge of how kids get placed into these types of classes and maybe how it's changed or evolved over the years and then generally go into a larger conversation about the structure and accessibility, perhaps in public education. I mean, we can talk about private education and, and art schools and, and how kids get into that. Like, mm-hmm. There's a lot to this question, and I, and I know that we can only cover so much. Yeah, Gianna, this is a really good question, and um, there's a lot to it. So I'm just gonna I'm gonna do the best I can. <laughs> yeah, of course. So first, how are students qualified for gifted? Most states have some sort of requirement that all students need to be screened for giftedness. So in my school district, we start in second grade, and that's because really before the age of eight, um, your IQ is pretty flexible, um, and then at the age of eight you know, it can change a little bit, but usually it's, it's pretty set. You know, you can still learn things. Obviously we're going to be lifelong learners, but as when we're talking about IQ, it's pretty, we're pretty set at the age of eight. So we give a screener to all second, fourth, and sixth graders. And we give the COGAT, which is a cognitive abilities test. Um, individual students can qualify in a number of different ways at any time in their educational career, but this screener is basically a catch-all for students um, in those three grades. So then based on the scores of that test and other factors, because we never want to make any educational decision on one test score, um, like their classroom performance and teacher recommendations, we can qualify students as gifted. And I'm doing like air quotes because there's a lot of ways that students can be gifted, but, um, and, and we, we do have opportunities for that, but we have so many students, we've got to have a way just to have a basic screener. So as students get older, we do also have ways to qualify for gifted based on leadership skills and fine arts. Like they can submit a portfolio of their artwork. They can do musical performances, things like that. So some schools choose to serve students through a pullout program, like what you were describing, Gianna. So usually once a week, students go into a separate class for an hour or so, and they do some sort of project-based learning or dive deeper into a subject that's not usually taught in your core subjects, reading, math, science, or social studies. And like, doesn't that sound awesome? <laughs> like just to leave your class for a week and just go Except do something? Except for the kid extra. like me who wasn't in gifted and felt bad because I thought I liked art and these people were doing cool things and I wasn't and I was like why Mm -hmm. the fuck (laughs) now I'm a fucking (laughs) art historian asshole like why did you pull me out of my math class yeah so while those students are are gone (laughs) oh by the way I was not in a gifted class either yeah neither of us were yeah it's fine Um, I think I did all right, though. (laughs) Um, So while those students are gone, the other students in their regular ed classroom, sometimes they'll like review previously taught concepts or the teacher might use this time for intervention for students who are struggling. And I have a lot of issues with pullout programs, like (laughs) for a lot of the reasons you just said. And so like, yeah, first of all, just because I'm not gifted doesn't mean I'm not struggling. So Mm -hmm. like the teachers using that time to work with struggling students, but I'm gifted. So I'm pulled out in this program, but I could like, maybe I'm gifted in math, but like I'm struggling in reading and I miss that time. Mm -hmm. I have a huge beef with this. And what you just described is you're going to pull out those other kids to do, you know, gifted art and culture classes. So supposedly as you're describing the kids who are not going to that extra class are staying in their classroom and they're focusing on those skills that they're struggling with, right? That is totally not what my experience was. Yeah. You know what What we did? The only thing I remember doing other than like 
literally maybe having nap time, just having quiet time, was that we would read a a book together. We would read a a group book together. And why I have such a struggle with this, and, and part of the reason why I wanted to share this question today was because I, and I've talked about this before, I very, very much struggled with school. I do have a learning, enable it, disability, whatever you want to call it. I am a dyslexic person. And it took me a very long time in my education to discover that I have dyslexia. So with that just came other struggles with learning. And being a struggling student, I had to do a different program. And it was an online program, and this was called Success Maker, right? So (laughs) with this online intervention program, do you know when I could have worked on that? I could have worked on that program while the class wasn't in session, right? I could have done it while the other kids were gifted and talented, right? That is not when I did it. I was told to do it while my teacher was teaching all of the other students and like learning together. So you know what I did with Success Maker? I would run through and I would click all of the buttons and all of the answers and I would not read the prompts and do what I, and learn how I was supposed to learn through the program because I was so scared that I was missing out on these other things happening. And so I had to do success maker till I was in fifth grade. And it's just because I, I, I click through all the buttons and like, to this day, I don't even know if that's probably the first time I've even said that out loud. Like, and I never told any of my teachers, they were like, your, your daughter is just failing all of these courses. But like, literally I, I did not do them because I wanted to be with everybody else. So like this whole separating and pull out program and these other like online teaching tools, like there's such a clear gap that I am, that, that was my experience. Yeah. Gianna, first of all, I love you and I wish I could hug you right now. Um, Some good trauma for you guys. You're welcome. (laughs) I'm so sorry that you had that experience. And that right there is why I feel like pull-out programs are really detrimental. and But on the flip side, what we hear a lot, like because my school district does not do a pull-out program, and so I'll tell you how that works in a bit, but um, what the complaints that we get without having a pull-out program is on the opposite side where they're like, my kid is gifted and they need to be with other gifted kids. <laughs> oh, God. And that – I'm going to get to that in a second, but <laughs> guys, like, No. No, (laughs) like there's so many things wrong with that. But like, so here's another thing. Why are all kids exposed to project-based learning and extras? Like, isn't that Mm -hmm. good for all kids? What's good for one subset of kids is usually good for all kids. Like when we talk about English language learners, the techniques and strategies that we use to teach English language learners are good for all English learners, like Mm -hmm. anybody who speaks English. So what's good for gifted students is good for all students if we want to push them to that higher level. Well, it also creates this issue. And the other aspect of it is that like arts is a privilege. Like you can only have access to it and you can only do these things if you accomplish other things. And that does not fit the goal of what STEM should be as what you describe, what STEAM should be, this melting pot and how they all come together. It's also that foundation that I think has problematically served this perception that we have of the arts, that it's unattainable. We have this Mm -hmm. gatekeeping and that Mm -hmm. starts very much in early education. Yeah. To, to insert right here, if you're interested in arts and early development, this is a plug for our, could your kid do that episode, which we can link as well, where we talk about that inaccessibility and this idea that art is not for your kid because your kid like can or cannot draw. There's an educational researcher named John Hattie, and he's best known for his work in measuring the effect size of things that influence student learning. And he found that teacher estimates of achievement has the largest effect size of the 256 influences that he studied. So basically what that means is the teacher's belief about the student being able to achieve something has a the greatest impact on student learning. So when you have students that say, you go over here, you go over here, that is like 
without saying it, saying like, I think you can do more. I think you can do less. Mm -hmm. And that's a huge problem because the greatest influence on student learning is what the teacher thinks the student is capable of, which I think is crazy. And it makes a lot of sense too, because if I said, you can't do this, you're going to live up to it and not do it. (laughs) Or if I said, you are absolutely capable of this. And, And there's more things that go into that, right? Like I have to make all of these educational decisions that support my belief that that students can do this, but but that's basically what it is. So when we have students together and we give all students the opportunity to do these project-based learning um, things that we give that we would normally give to just our gifted students, it it brings everybody up, and it and you know some students are not are maybe not going to meet that demand to the same level that a student who is identified as gifted will, but that's okay. They had the opportunity and they were exposed to it, you know, and then there are also a lot of gifted students who just don't care and they don't want to go and do that, the, all the extra and above and beyond. And when they're put in with students who really care and want to try, like it helps everybody. So, you know, I think, I think that everybody benefits. I know that everybody benefits from that. So Mm -hmm. going off of that and these kind of extracurricular ideas that we've been tossing around and this idea of separating the arts and kind of putting them into different categories, I would like to talk about electives and Gianna, this question that you had earlier really focused on education at an early age and in those elementary years, it seems like many of those elective courses that we are required to take in middle school and high school are categorized under the big, big umbrella of the arts. So why is it that while particularly in high school, there are these kind of different options um, as to which science or math class you can take? So you could take like AP calculus or algebra, but you still have to take a math. But with an elective, you have to pick which arts lane you're interested in. And it's required of you to take elective, to take an elective, but it's not required in the same way that it is with that kind of math example. Like you don't get an art class and you can take ceramics or drawing. So kind of simplified, how come the arts are viewed as elective courses in higher ed? And does this continually add to that issue of a separation and one being viewed as more important than the other? And then all of you know, everybody says, oh, that's a blow-off class. How do we stop perpetuating this idea that those electives are blow-off classes when they are more often than not categorized under the arts umbrella? Yeah, um, this is a really hard question to answer. So I don't have like a definitive, this is the answer to your question, but I have a couple of ideas. <laughs> that's and a, the we reason... never have definitive answers <laughs> on our pop talk. I think the reason this is hard to answer is because a lot of education is let up, left up to state control. And so um, I can tell you a lot about how Oklahoma operates, but they're, um, you know, we don't have like federal, a lot of federal guidelines for how mm education should be in pre-K through 12. We have some general ones, but anyways, so one, this is my, my first maybe guess at it. (laughs) The core subjects, math, English, social studies, and science are core because when our modern education system was created, um, those subjects would churn out the most confident individuals with the foundational knowledge to be productive citizens, Mm -hmm. especially when we moved into the industrial revolution and out of a majority of agricultural jobs. So like, that's what they focused on because, okay, with these things, you can go out and you can be productive. So I was doing some research on this question and I, I found a really hard time, or it was really hard to find a timeline of electives, like when that, um, where they were kind of brought in on top of those four core subjects. But my best guess is that they just continue to expand all the way up until we introduce No Child Left Behind, which was um, education law that was passed in 2001. And that law said that schools could not receive federal funding unless they participated and scored at a certain level, like in um, standardized tests. 
So with those requirements, schools put most of their effort into meeting and maintaining those scores. And they didn't really have a choice to focus on anything but those tested subjects because that's where they got their funding from. And then in turn, they spent a lot of that money that they got on high quality teachers in those core subjects because those higher test scores meant continued funding. It's a vicious, vicious cycle. So then in 2015, the Every Child Succeeds Act replaced No Child Left Behind. And while it still requires accountability, it gives more control to states on how to hold schools accountable. So this is a step in the right direction, but I also have a lot of thoughts about standardized testing, and that's going to have to wait for another episode because I could talk for days about that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think it's, it's basically you know, those are not, those are required because it's tied to funding and test scores. And that's a terrible answer. (laughs) So then my other thought on this is in general, we know that education is underfunded. And the first thing to go when we have budget cuts are the extras or the subjects that aren't tested. And I hate that like band and art and all of those extra things. I say extras, I'm using it right now, but I hate that they're considered extras because we saw in the pandemic, especially um, that that's why kids come to school. You know, like you have to do math and science and reading, but like the reason that kids are invested in what they do is all of the extras and I have like air quotes but like all of those things I mean Josh is a my husband right he's a band teacher and I just see and I was in band too you guys are in band like Mm -hmm. that was the reason I showed up I mean I loved school I obviously became a teacher and I continued to go to school every single day of my life (laughs) but like you know that's where I made all those connections so um but as far as being blow off classes I think that those teachers just understand how much pressure students are under. I think that they, you know, it's not that they think that their subject isn't important, but they want to give students a place to feel relaxed and to be creative without the pressure that comes with standardized testing. So sure, there's students that just don't care, but I think it's because they haven't found their passion, not because the teacher isn't treating the subject like it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And I think a great example of this now, obviously, there's exceptions to the rule everywhere. But I think in general, like, this is how most of our elective teachers think. So a great example of this is so we know we just said Josh teaches band. And last year, when um, his school was going back and forth between full virtual and AB and in person, um, he had a student who was very capable, but was failing a couple of his classes. So Josh had him come in during band time and helped him with his core classwork. Not because band wasn't important, but because that's what the student needed to pass his classes to graduate and to pass those stupid standardized tests, right? Yeah. So it's not Josh's fault, but there's a lot of pressure on that kid, and he wasn't going to be able to focus on music until those priorities were taken care of. So wrong or right, that's the American education system. Right. Oh, God, I have so many thoughts. Yes. My, <laughs> my mind is, is reeling right now, and I'm thinking about – gender dynamics in elective courses and thinking about like marriage and family planning that I took as an elective course and then how that compares to something like athletics or how I'm just like I'm oh this is wild I have so much to say but you in in particular mentioned the pandemic and um first of all I think we all just want to thank you and thank Josh for all of the work that you've done during the pandemic you always work hard and all of your teachers work hard in quote unquote normal times. But thank you so much for everything that you've done during the pandemic. Um, So let's talk about that a little bit. (laughs) What effect uh, has the pandemic had on STEAM in the classroom in particular? Yeah, the pandemic has touched every single part of our lives. And this isn't an exception. Mm-hmm. So I think the, the biggest thing that we saw was that when we, in March, 2020, teachers had two weeks to completely reimagine teaching and they took all of their coursework and they put it online and they did it. Guys, I'm sorry. I'm going to start crying. Like they just did it. And it was the most incredible thing to watch. Like holy cow, teachers are superheroes. And like, I, I was just, there as a support, like, tell me what you need. Like, how can I help you? And, um, 
they're incredible. But what I saw with that, like from an educator side, was that um, student engagement is always at the top of their mind. So there was a lot of fear then. We didn't really know a whole lot about coronavirus and like how that was, you know, how is it transmissible? And, you know, when was this like, you know, peak going to hit? And so Mm -hmm. students had a lot going on and teachers really had to focus and like, how can I get students engaged and to focus in this completely new environment and, you know, kind of forget about what's going on outside and focus on algebra, right? So how how are they (laughs) going to do that? And so I think right here where we talk about the creative and being innovative, that's what teachers did right here because they had to completely reimagine what they were doing online, which means, you know, like, let's talk about graphic design and like basically like website design. And and Mm -hmm. when you're talking about video, like, yeah, I can put a video up, but they immediately had to become like videographers and producers and figure out how to make their videos more engaging so that their students would pass their classes and continue to learn something. So then on the flip side, you've got students who are also being super innovative because I think we had like a day or a half a day where they were like, if you need something from school, come get it now. And we had to like break them up into, so like if they missed that day, they didn't have like all of their school supplies and, mm-hmm. and things that they normally have at school. So not so much like, um, you know, the design part, but just being innovative and in how they're thinking and how they, you know, collaborate with, um, with other students not being in person. It was just, it was really incredible to see, that shift and how it happened so quickly. And it's still happening. You know, we, most of our students are back in person. We're back five days a week this year, but we still have students who are choosing to be virtual. We still have students who are going to be in quarantine. Um, and so this, it's just, it's really incredible to watch and see how creative and innovative teachers and students are through everything. So moving forward, I want to talk about how you view STEM and STEAM and should we actually be productively using these categories and keeping this terminology? Because it seems like also, as you explained earlier, even sometimes the use of just the word STEM or even just the word STEAM isn't really accomplishing what it should be. It's not doing what it was originally created to do. You talked about how it's not just these distinctive categories. It is interdisciplinary learning, but is that happening? So vocabulary really does matter. So do you have some insights as to any vocabulary that we can or should be using to still encourage interest in all the sciences, but also while acknowledging those creative paths and artistic roles as we talked about before? Yeah, I mean, like I've said, it's not just four box. like STEM is not just four boxes that you check off. Like I've taught science, I've taught technology, I've taught engineering. That's not what it is. It is teaching those subjects through a lens um, to foster that critical thinking, problem solving, communication, and collaboration. And then if I'm being completely honest, I don't think we should say STEM anymore. I think we just should always say STEAM mm-hmm. because we, I mean, we've had plenty of examples, even in this time together, where that creativity and innovation is really hard to separate. And even if I could separate it, why would I want to? So I just think, you know, again, it's not a checkbox of I'm teaching this and this and this. It's I'm teaching these subjects through this lens of critical thinking, problem solving, communication, collaboration, creativity, and innovation. And that takes... I mean, that sounds like an impossible task, but we have incredible teachers doing it every single day. I'll add, I think that this this idea that you've, you've brought to us and our listeners today of that lens, I think that is such an important word that's really opened my mind to, to even the foundations of STEM and how it works. I think incorporating that word, a STEAM lens, really just opens up so many more possibilities. And and I hope that works both ways too. So for the people who in our TikTok comments, maybe were kind of on the other side or, or wanted more of that separation to happen between the arts and sciences, um, I think using a STEAM lens or creative lens or, or, or 
adding on that word really opens up just the possibilities and, and breaks down those boxes. So thank you so much for for talking with us about about that today. I think it's just amazing and, and so important and I really appreciate it. Yeah, I yeah. hope it's helpful to kind of redefine that for people. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think it's safe to say it is very helpful because as we learn, and I'm about to ask Adrian a little fun question here before we end today, I know that I even joke about my lack of participation on TikTok and so often Bianca is the one that's kind of putting her her face on our, our platform or this particular platform. And it's truly because I do have a very hard time engaging with people on those platforms. I, I, and it's hard because I don't believe in like the drama of the internet com- like comment section, but also that's the only way to have conversations on that platform. So it's complex for us because we started this type of media platform and that's how we are supposed to engage with people. But I have to decide and be very conscientious about what conversations I'm willing to have on that platform because I don't always think it is quite frankly, worth it all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, But that's why it's so important that you're here today. But Adrian, I also know that you recently just joined the world of TikTok. (laughs) It's a crazy place. (laughs) And, um, you know, um, I know, or maybe I'm wrong to assume, but I would perhaps suggest that you are on educator TikTok. And if so, how are those guys doing? What teacher memes are we getting right now? And like with the kiddos being back, like give us an update. We are going to link Adrian's TikTok because it's just, it's so funny. If you love Boy of APT, Jameson's Dean Turner, aka APT nephew, he makes a great appearance on Adrian's page. Yeah, guys. Okay, I'm quite a bit older than you. I don't know if your listeners know that, but I am an elder millennial on TikTok. And guys, like it- That was a rough place to be, girl. (laughs) (laughs) I would not want to be you on TikTok, I'll tell you that much. Those Gen Zers are wild. They're brutal. Okay, no, I I love it. Like I, here's the thing. Laughter is definitely a form of self-care. And I, like, if it starts to be a serious TikTok, I just keep scrolling. Like I need to Mm -hmm. be able to laugh, but, um, teachers of TikTok is the best place to be because I firmly believe that nurses and teachers have the best stories ever, (laughs) but nurses stories are gross (laughs) and teacher (laughs) stories are hilarious. So like, if you ever need a really good laugh, you just need to ask an elementary teacher about kindergarten lunch duty. (laughs) That is going to be it's amazing. So I just hope that my content makes people laugh um, because we all need some humor right now. That's for sure. It makes me laugh. I watched the one about Jameson getting ready for the first day of school like 20 times. I I love that. Yeah, that's a good one. I mean, I think, you know, in general, like teachers are hopeful, you know, there is, there was so much unknown last August and we know more Mm -hmm. about what's going on right now. It's not new. We've been teaching in a pandemic for a year now and like, Teachers, we all want things back to normal, but they have a few more tools in their belt. So I think that we're going to be okay. They're going to be focusing on relationships. We're going to get these cool. We have these kids coming back to school who haven't been there since March 2020. And we just need to rebuild that trust and make school a safe place so that kids Mm -hmm. can focus on learning. So. Yeah. Well, we are going to link your TikTok for everyone, but is there anything that you would like to plug and, and anything else you want our listeners to know? Um, any good resources for them. We'll link in our resources page for you as well. Yeah. Um, well, you go follow my photography page. I, um, you know, getting school started is always pretty busy, but here in about in a couple of weeks, I'm going to spend all my weeknights and weekends doing photography. Um, I love that. That's where I get to be creative and I get to kind of not put work aside and that is my creative outlet. So, um, yeah. And I can have some links for you. Um, a lot of the resources that I found on steam education and, um, just the great things educators are doing. If you want to learn more about it, I will put that in the show notes. Great. Sweet. Adrian, thanks so much for being here. We're so excited that you all got to officially meet her, the whole Fink fam. Now I hope you guys have a great picture of the 
kind of wildness that's happening <laughs> behind the scenes. I love you guys so much. <laughs> oh, my oh my gosh. We love you. And with that, everybody, you know where to find us, follow us, listen to us, and we will talk to you all next Tuesday. Bye, everyone. Bye. Art Pop Talk's executive producers are me, Bianca Martucci Fink. And me, Gianna Martucci Fink. Music and sounds are by Josh Turner, and photography is by Adrian Turner. And our graphic designer is Sid Hammond. <laughs>